next guest published his first novel, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which is now in its 63rd printing, having sold over 7 million copies. He is in New York to attend the festivities celebrating the 50th anniversary of Esquire magazine, and we're delighted to have him here with us tonight. Please welcome Ken Kesey. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Boy, oh boy. You make a great entrance. You look terrific. What, uh, you want to you talk about this uh, first, or you want to get to that later? Let's, let's talk about my hat. Okay, tell me about the hat. Check that hat, the, where it's from. D-Flex, non-spot, rain-resistant, Im imported Milan. Is that right? Yeah. Milan. Now the last word. Hemp. <laughs> show it in the side of this hat. Now, this is a hemp hat, folks. This here ball of string is a ball of baling twine that I've been collecting over the last, uh, oh, many years. The stuff on the outside is sisal, but you see this nice stuff inside there? Yeah. That's hemp. Uh-huh. Hemp's an important product. If we can get... <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, a hemp suit that I was going to wear. While I'm wearing the suit, this is left over from the Esquire party last night. My hemp suit looks about like the hat. <laughs> I sent it out to be pressed, and it hasn't shown back up. <laughs> no, I, probably not. Now, do you, do you travel with the ball of hemp wherever you go? No, I brought it here specifically because uh, usually when you come on this show, you have to have something to publicize, uh, a and movie, you, a book, or something. Out pushing hemp. Yeah, I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any uh, hot sauce. <laughs> now, you know, uh, last night Dinah Shore was here uh, mentioning uh, she cooked and also. Uh, as uh, she said that you were her uh, all-time favorite. Now, have you ever met the woman? Do you? Yeah, I did. I met her uh, at uh, Jerry Brown's office when he was governor. Mm -hmm. and what was the festivity or the occasion? I think she was cooking for him or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she was, a, as she left, both he and I looked at each other. And I said, well, God, this is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. He yeah. said, yeah. I said, why didn't we tell her this? And uh, it's one of those things with beautiful women. Sometimes you get tongue-tied. Yeah, you're in awe, so you wait till they leave and yeah. open up. Now, tell me about the festivity last night. This was uh, in honor of Esquire's 50th anniversary. Right. And uh, they featured the 50, um, uh, 50 people who have changed life in this country. Or was right. it just worldwide? Or worldwide? Yeah, United States. Yeah. Uh, 50 who made the difference, the thing is called. It's, uh, and they picked 50 people to write about these people. Um, Mailer does Jackie Onassis. Um, let's see, uh, Dr. Carl, uh, uh, Dr. Lewis does uh, uh, Watson, the guy that discovered DNA. Um, they, they're doing Disney. Uh, Ray Blunt does Presley. Yeah. I do Kerouac. This was uh, quite a gathering last night, huh? It started yesterday morning at uh, 7.30 at the mayor's. Mayor Koch. Koch. Yeah. <laughs> Koch, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, we went in there where there was just press everywhere. And Who there really impressed you, really took you aback, really knocked you out? Oh, Muhammad Ali, man. Yeah, this is, uh, Muhammad Ali is uh, like a little angel. I mean, a big angel, uh -huh. but uh, he's, he's uh, sweet. His eyes are merry. He's a, a wonderful man. I felt, I was sitting between uh, Ali and Elaine, you know, from Elaine's restaurant, yeah. the literary woman. Yeah. Two real heavyweights. I felt uh, uh, privileged. <laughs> uh, how's Ali doing? You hear a lot of reports. People say, "Oh, he's uh, he's suffering uh, years of being in the ring." Uh, what did he seem like to you? Oh, he's bored. He'd like to have something to do. You know, he's l like uh, Red Fox. You know, he's m maybe he in prime time, but he's still hot stuff and knows it. And somebody said to him, "said uh, You're kind of slurring your speech, Ali." And he says. Uh, he said, people have been hitting me upside the head for 25 years. He says, let me hit you upside the head once and see how you talk. <laughs> <laughs> in, in this uh, issue of Esquire, you, as you mentioned, you wrote about uh, Kerouac. And in the article, you say that uh, there's argument for him to be canonized. Why is that? What do you mean that, by that? Well, I, I judge art by uh, how it makes you feel. Um, you go to a movie, and if you don't feel better about people when you come out of the movie, then, you know, the art, if it doesn't lift you up as a human being, and Kerouac, everything you ever read by Kerouac, he doesn't, I mean, puts himself down, but it left everybody that read On the Road 
feeling a lot better about the American uh, scene, the American people. Um, everybody who read that book for the first time got in the car immediately, headed off across the country, got loaded and loved everybody. And yeah. that's uh, canonization business, you know. He's as good as uh, Mother Teresa in his own league. Did you get to know him at all? Oh, we met a time or two. Uh, by then he was defensive, you, you know, there were kids coming up at him with on-the-road t-shirts and wanting to uh, get loaded he with was, him. Yeah, he was gun-shy. Yeah, he was. Point. How old a man was he when you finally met him? Oh, he was uh, 40, going on 60 or so, something like that. Yeah. He, was, uh, he was getting some brown around the edges. Yeah. And uh, in, yeah, not, not so good a shape, or? Well, he was in good shape, but just that uh, everybody in the world was taking shots at him. Um, he was a vulnerable guy. Yeah. You know, when you stand up like that and and lay yourself open like that, people come around and walk in your noodles. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we have to pause here for a commercial. When we come back, I know there's a, a little bit of a story about your tuxedo. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, we'll think of one. <laughs> Okay. Uh, now the the tuxedo. Is there, that Steppenwolf? Is that, are they, yeah. No. yeah. This is this is the original Steppenwolf. Here. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> they Steppenwolf. Yeah, they're doing all right. <laughs> the tuxedo. All right. Okay. Uh, Twenty years ago, just do almost to the day, I was here um, for the opening of Cuckoo's Nest, and we were supposed to go to the Four Seasons. It, it's these sort of things that make me believe in God and angels and, and elves and stuff. Um, and they had booked me into a place I was supposed to get a tuxedo measured. And I hadn't thought about this. My wife and I haven't been back here in 20 years. We're coming up out of Grand Central Station. We see a tuxedo shop, and I'm up there getting measured for this tuxedo. And this guy says, I remember you. You were here uh, 20 years ago being measured for a tuxedo. Uh, I says, right, right, and went to Cougar's Nest took peyote all the way across the country while the president was being killed. So I'm not going to drive across the country <laughs> this time. Uh, <laughs> so now, no, but you, you mentioned that there are other coincidences in your life that reinforce that feeling. One, uh, the, uh, the Chet Helms uh, story. Can you tell that? You explain that? Oh, Lordy. Oh, well, this guy came in. This was just after John Lennon was killed. And his name was John the Groupie. He showed up. It was really cold. He'd been standing around uh, outside. He'd hitchhiked all the way from uh, uh, Venice West up there in a, yeah. a little short sleeve shirt and uh, torn up sneakers. And I gave him all sorts of crap saying, what are you doing up here? You don't know me. He said, I just want to come up with you. He says, I got something that this I know that you'd like Oregon? to have. He comes up? Yeah, he yeah. Comes, up, comes up and shows up up there. I said, no, I, I don't want it. He said, listen, I've got Chet Helms' uh, phone number. Uh, Chet Helms used to be, he was, he was almost Bill Graham. He was running a thing in San Francisco called The Family Dog. He was a big time promoter. And I said, no, I don't, I don't, never needed Chet Helms' phone. He said, this is not his answering services. This is his real phone number. I said, I don't have any need for Chet Helms' phone number. I've never needed it. Uh, he said, okay, he put it back in his pocket, and that night, we were watching uh, the Patriots, I think, play the Chargers, going for a big-time playoff berth, and Howard Cosell interrupts the uh, show to say, uh, but we must remember it is just a football game, which I thought was a very un-Howard Cosell-like thing to say. And then later on, he's, during this play-action fake that's going down, he says that John Lennon has been shot and killed in the streets of New York. And this guy and I turned and looked at each other, and, you know, suddenly he wasn't just an old hippie anymore, and I wasn't uh, a landowner. We were buddies, and we were hurt. And the next day, I took him to the freeway and gave him some clothes and gave him some money and put him back on the freeway hitchhiking back south. And I got home, and the phone was ringing, and this guy was asking um, me to help him. He said, I'd like some help. Uh, they're going to do a, a John Lennon... Uh, memorial service in Golden Gate Park 
and I thought he was asking me to come down and mm -hmm. um, do a eulogy. And I told him, no, we got Christmas programs coming up, and I got to fix the fence, and I got to wind my wind bailiff's drink. Sure. <laughs> now, this is a different guy on the phone, not this the guy a, a who guy had visited you. Yeah, yeah. Just, he was just a promoter. And he said, no, no, that's not what I wanted. He said, I, I'm calling to ask if uh, you happen to have Chet Helms's phone number. I need some help putting this show together. And uh, But I missed it. It was one of those things which it makes you... Yeah. understand when uh, you're living in Reagan's time, it's hard to remember what it was like in Kennedy's time. <laughs> well, yeah, you start, you start thinking, well, maybe yeah. things are pretty well figured out here. Now, you, you mentioned uh, Cuckoo's Nest. You came in for the play. Yeah. Now, but you, you have not yet seen the film. I swear to God, I haven't seen the movie. Now, why won't you go see, if you go to see the play, why won't you go see the film? Do you ever know any Hollywood lawyers? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I well, sure have. I, uh sued those suckers because uh, they weren't paying me nickel one and I sued them and finally fought it out in depositions day after day them asking me all sorts of awful questions and talking about how I really uh, uh, would like to be in Hollywood that I'm jealous and they said I'm going to be the first one in line out there to see this movie and I said I swear to God, I will never see your cheesy piece of stuff in my life. I swear <laughs> to God, I won't see it. And so when it opened, it premiered in my hometown. And Ooh. They, <laughs> they called and all the press and wanted me down there to see it. I said, that's like calling and saying, hey, uh, the Hells Angels are raping your daughter in the parking lot. Would you like to watch? <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, my, oh, my. Uh, but, so so you, didn't, you didn't make much money off the deal? You made no money off the, the film rights? Or? Oh, no, they, we settled, and I got some money. Got huh? some money, uh -huh. but you still haven't seen it. Yeah, that's amazing. We got to uh, go away again, Ken. We'll be right back, folks. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Ken, very nice to meet you. Thank you for your time, sir. It was a pleasure to have you here. Take care. Have a good trip back to Oregon. Um, also, thanks to Red Fox and David Copeland.